Hey y'all, welcome back. I hope you made it through Legal Issues Part 1 and we'll jump into Legal Issues Part 2. Welcome to CASRN, where I teach you about all things nursing. In this video, we're going to cover civil versus criminal law, negligence, HIPAA, and various laws and organizations. First off, what's important to understand is that there is a difference between criminal intent and civil intent uh, when it comes to law. So criminal is going to be an action where there was an injury to the public in some way or another. So this is going to be something like murder or assault, drunk driving, etc. And that suit is usually brought by the government, either federal or state, which is known as the prosecution. And then the results of this are usually decided by a jury. Then in civil law, it's going to be a little bit different because this is an injury to a private party and this suit is brought up by that private party and they're also called the plaintiff and the suit is usually decided by a judge. In nursing, you can be accused of negligence and malpractice, which is essentially just some substandard care. Negligence is unintended harm and malpractice is when you've knowingly or willfully done something that you know you're not supposed to do. And these can be acts of commission or omission. So some examples that we might see here are going to be medication errors that have resulted in injury, falls resulting from failure to provide an appropriate safety intervention, failure to monitor or report or to use sterile technique. These are just a couple of examples. There's a lot of other things out there that can happen. So this is definitely not all of them, but it is important to understand that when you do not do what you should do as a nurse, you do run the risk of being brought up on charges of negligence or malpractice. Now, tort law is what addresses the wrong that caused injury. And as we already discussed, we've got that civil law and the negligence. So the nurse is neglecting to do what the patient requires. Then we've got the malpractice is when the nurse on duty provides a standard of care and, and fails to do that, which results in injury. We've got assault, which is the threat of harm. So this is if the patient believes that they will be harmed. So if you've got a patient who's not doing what you need them to do or they're not being cooperative and you threaten them and they truly believe that they can be harmed, then that's considered assault. And then battery is when you actually touch that patient without consent. So just remember to be aware of what's going on with that patient. Realize that we're doing our best to help them, but we are in no way forcing them to accept our care. We're there to help and support and educate but we definitely cannot force anybody to receive care and make sure that you get that consent and build rapport with that patient so that they know that they can trust you so they're willing to get the care that they need. And if they refuse to do so, that is 100% their choice because it is in fact their body. Advanced directives is basically just something that the patient is going to create about their choices with healthcare interventions if they can't verbalize. So typically when a patient is first admitted to your unit or your facility you should ask about advanced directives. If the patient has a copy, then you can make a copy of that and get it to medical records. Or you may need to fill out a new one with the form that's used by your facility. If they don't have one, then this is a really important time to find out what care they want if they cannot verbalize their desires later on. So you're gonna have some Thing like an instructional directive. And this is going to be the type of treatment that the patient wants or refuses once they can no longer verbalize the desires and is usually used for people who are terminally ill. The durable power of attorney is this is when a patient appoints somebody to make those decisions for them when they cannot. And then a DNR is something you might see, it's called do not resuscitate. This essentially means that you're not gonna do CPR on them. So when I would have somebody that would be admitted to my facility, we would go through and we would ask things like, what kind of care do you want? Do you want comfort care? Do you want full blown care, which we're gonna put you on a respiratory machine. We're gonna do everything we can to help save you. Or do you want to be what we call a DNR, which means do not resuscitate. So if I come in and find you not breathing, do you want me to just let you pass peaceably? And each person is going to have different opinions on this, especially depending on their age and their diagnosis and what they've got going on in their lives individually. So make sure it's not your job as a nurse to convince them to do one thing or the other. You want to make sure that their opinions are something that they can discuss with themselves or their families, that they're not being coerced in any decision and that they can do what they feel is best for them. 
documentation is so important. If you don't write it down, it did not happen. So this is legally required. You are required by law to make sure that you document everything that happened. It should be objective and factual and complete. And it needs to include any treatments that you've done, which includes medications, treatments and procedures, responses to those treatments. This is part of our nursing process, right? We do an intervention and then we want to follow up and see if it was effective. We want to talk about consent and the fact that the patient consented to having that treatment done or that they signed a consent or whatever consent that we're looking at. And then talk about any interactions that we had with the providers. So that can be with the doctors or the nurses or any other staff that goes in. I recommend using quotation marks for patient statements, and then you can just put in verbatim what they said. Um, I've had multiple times when I've had combative patients, and so I will just put in quotation marks everything they say, which can be vulgar at times as well. So just make sure you include that in there, and it's just factual. We're not, we're not trying to lead it down one way or the other. We're just saying this is what the patient said to me, and this is what happened, and make sure it gets charted in the and in that quotation mark. And then, of course, we're, we should never go back and change documentation uh, that we've done or that anybody else has done. And, and a lot of times now with the electronic software that people are using at the LC, you can go in and go to somewhere where you've documented something and link a follow-up or a clarification or something like that so that it can be more clear to anybody that's coming up and following behind that and trying to figure out what's going on uh, to link it if it's pertinent. But we do not change. HIPAA is the end all be all of healthcare. Basically, I like this that just what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. What happens in your health facility stays in your health facility. It's known as the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. It was passed into federal law in 1996 and basically describes how personal information, which is known as PHI, and how it can be used in the healthcare settings. So we're very restricted on what we can and can't do with people's healthcare information and who we can and cannot share it with. So this just, it's to ensure proper safeguards to keeping that information private. There are things that happen in your doctor's office that you don't want your next door neighbor to know about. So this basically is gonna be used with insurance companies, uh, various treatments that we need to do if we need to refer somebody out to a specialist, um, any kind of operations and services. Sometimes it's allowed in data aggregation, but it's usually uh, very simplified in that way. It doesn't give away like identifying information. It can be called to court and used in legal proceedings if necessary. Uh, if you want to know more about this, you can go to the U.S. Department of Health for all the different exceptions that this information can be shared with. But basically, the idea here is that it's private. And unless somebody is directly involved with that patient's care, you shouldn't be telling them any information. Now, on that same thread of PHI, we've got our personal health information. This is individual identification in the past, present, or future. So at any time, if a patient can be identified by this information, you cannot be sharing it. So this includes names, dates, any kind of demographic information, medical history, lab results, mental health, insurance information, contact information. Like we cannot identify this person. Now, there are some exceptions to sharing PHI. And we do sometimes have to report information. So nurses are considered mandated reporters, which means that there are certain situations where the nurse is required to report either to the law enforcement or to public health agencies specific information, specifically communicable diseases and criminal activity where somebody is at risk. So like domestic violence. Now, this is going to vary a little bit based on your the age of the patient and your state and what those laws may require. So be careful with this and make sure that you do understand the various laws in the state that you're in. And you can look those up on your state legislation websites. So again, domestic violence is going to depend on the age and the decision making capability of the victim. If the victim is an adult and chooses not to report, the nurse cannot do anything. But like I said, depending on your state, you may be required to report suspicious injuries regardless of patient consent. There's other things like communicable diseases like STIs and TBs and some waterborne illnesses and other things that are required to be reported to the public health agency so that they can make sure those people are getting the treatment that they need and they will follow up with them. I did have one experience where I've seen a positive tuberculosis test 
And we did have to report that to our local health department. And they followed up with that patient because the antibiotics for that that specific bacteria are nine months. And so they wanted to make sure that that patient took those antibiotics every day for the next nine months, which is a lot to follow up on. So and make sure that they can do. So they'll they'll take that over and make sure that it's not going to be spread and do any harm to the rest of the public. Uh, like we talked about abuse and neglect, we've got child ne- abuse or neglect, elderly or domestic violence. And like I said, for domestic violence, that's going to depend on the age and the decision making capability of your patient. But when we're talking about the children and the elderly, we are required to report that in order to keep them safe. We also need to report animal bites, gunshots or stab wounds, any kind of assault, an impaired provider, which means somebody who's coming to work or doing care is drunk or under the influence of drugs. Anything that goes against OSHA, there are places where you can report that, which is just having occupational safety. We'll talk about that on the next slide. And cases of sexual harassment in the workplace. So OSHA is the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. This was put in in 1970. And this is basically just to create a safe and healthy working environment for employees. And if there is something that's unsafe, you can report that anonymously. The ADA is Americans with Disability Act, and this prevents discrimination against people with disabilities. So this includes employment, transportation, public accommodations, communication, and access to public services. So something that you might see in healthcare are people who cannot communicate verbally. And as healthcare providers, we are required by law to provide those individuals with translation services to accommodate their healthcare needs. The Emergency Medical Treatment and Labor Act was developed in 1986, and this is basically anyone that's seeking care in an emergency situation cannot be turned away. So if you go to an emergency department and you're having a life-threatening situation, they cannot turn you away based on your ability to pay. We have to treat them and help them. It, It doesn't matter of their ability to be able to pay or not because we need them to be safe. And that's why we work in healthcare. That's what we're doing, right? Is that we want to be able to help other people uh, achieve the the highest level of health that they can have. So just a quick review here. We've got civil and criminal law, which is going to be the difference between doing something to the public and doing something to a private party. And one's going to be the prosecution and one's going to be the plaintiff. Negligence is when you do or don't do something, but you unintentionally cause harm, and then malpractice is when you intentionally cause harm. HIPAA is the privacy law that you want to make sure that you rule by. I've seen HIPAA broken accidentally more than once, so you definitely want to make sure that you're keeping those things to yourself. And then the various laws and organizations that have been put into place that do rule what we do as nurses and we need to make sure that we're aware of those so that we can protect us from those accusations of negligence or malpractice. Thanks for tuning in. Please help me grow my channel by clicking subscribe and follow below. 